The whole thing started out uh, in 1961 when we had to leave uh, Cuba. My name is Jay Goldberg. I, uh, and uh, in 1961, my sister and I, at that time I was uh, 10 years old, and we had to leave Cuba to come to the United States. And uh, a year and a half after that, uh, my parents were able to come over and uh, they had to come in with uh, $3 on their pocket and they lost everything that they had back in the old country. So tell me about this sneaker fetish. They started to work for this family that really got very, you know, they, they got close to them and they had a lot of faith in them. And uh, a few years later, they, uh, they, were, they wanted to sell the business. It was in uh, Williamsburg. And my parents said, look, you know, we have no money. We can't buy the business from you guys. You know, there's other people that are coming over here. They're solvent and they'd be able to buy the business from you. He says, no, this is going to be yours. And people kept coming in and they wouldn't sell it to anybody. And to make a long story short, uh, they bought the business on terms that, that they gave them. And by then I was already 13 years old and it was like a general merchandise store. Everything in sneakers, shoes, and... At that time, it was, you know, lower-end sneakers and stuff like that. And uh, that was the uh, my beginning in the shoe business at the age of 13. At a young age of 20, I got married. And uh, at that time, my parents, uh, after we got married, they, they had sold that business that they were in. They were involved in some other business, also in the sneaker business in uh, Pitkin Avenue in Brooklyn on a... Uh, really, really urban area, and we used to do a lot of Converse in those days, Chuck Taylors, a lot of Adidas, Superstars, uh, some of the Jabars, which were hot in those days. And uh, my parents moved down to Miami, and I stayed up in New York. I, uh, that was uh, my first purchase of a business on my own, which was a shoe store in uh, 3rd Avenue between 105th and 106th Street. Uh, at that time, it was Spanish Harlem, today's Upper East Side. And uh, it went, you know, it worked out very nice. We were there for a few years, and then the opportunity came to buy the store next door to it, which was owned by the same guy who I was renting from. And we bought the, uh, we bought the store, it was a men's store. And uh, that's how I got involved both into the clothing business and the, uh, and the, uh, the, you know, the shoe business itself. And the name of the, uh, the shoe store was Chick Shoes, C-H-I-C-K. And uh, we called that store at the time El Barrio Men's Shop, being that it was right on the El Barrio area. And uh, we were there until 1980. At that time, Miami was going through uh, a lot of changes, a big, big boom down here which turned out to be a false economy with the South American business. And uh, the rest of the country was hurting, which is usually the way it works. When Miami is booming, the rest of the country is hurting. And uh, my dad was saying, you got to come down. You got to come down. Uh, we have two locations. We're going to open it up. It was actually, it was in 79. And we came down. And we, we were able to open up our first store. We opened up the Nike line. We were able to open up the Nike line. This was in 19, I want to say it was 1979, because we opened up the store in 1980. By the time that we opened up the store, because it took a little bit longer than we expected, we had over $150,000 worth of merchandise sitting in my dad's living room in, uh, in, in Miami Beach because the store wasn't ready. Uh, there was an opportunity to open up uh, right next door to uh, my parents store or, or our store and uh, it was actually it was half of the store it was just you know where that uh, thing is for just half of it and we started out really small within like six months uh, the guy next uh, door which was this area where we are right now he used to be a small little electronic store he moved out and uh, you know we, we you know we spread it open, and we kept on going. I've always been interested in the you know the urban shoes and and uh, the uh, the Jordans and the Forces, and always had my collections here. And uh, a few years later, I uh, I was lucky enough to uh, hook up with this uh, young man who's been working with me for quite a few years already, 
and uh, also he's a sneaker freak. And uh, between him and I, we got this business going. It was different because in those days, it was uh, the Adidas, uh, it was the uh, Bird Bruin, it was the, uh, the, it was just three, you know, half a dozen styles and half a dozen things, you know, it was the Oceania, Nike Oceania, the Bird Bruin, and uh, some of those, uh, you know, and of course from Adidas it was the uh, Superstars and, uh, and the Chucks were big. Uh, actually, before the Chucks Day, it was another sh a shoe called the Coach, which was a you know poor man's uh, Chuck Taylor who couldn't afford it, or uh, or even Converse wouldn't sell regular stores, the All Stars. They would only go into the sporting goods stores, so they were able to get the other one, the Coach. So it was you know it was it was a little bit different than it is right now. Uh, you know Nike was. Uh, not as lenient and a little more retail friendly than it is today. Uh, you know, it's, things are changing. Uh, there are changes going on. Uh, you know, part, going partners with some other big uh, units, and uh, it's not easy for the independent uh, to, you know, to, to stay alive. Uh, there's not that much product for us to get. Uh, you know, we were able to pick up the phone and uh, there was always product to be bought. Today there's no uh, product to be bought. And when there is product to be bought, there's not that much chance of the independent getting a hold of it because uh, it ends up going to, you know, to the outlets or, or, or to wherever else it's going. So it's, you know, it's gotten tough for the independent to, uh, to stay in business. It was, it, it's funny because uh, the, it was, at that time, the, uh, the Bird Bruin was a big shoe. And there was another one that I can't think of the name right now, which was uh, like the Bruin, you know, the court bottom, the basketball bottom, and, uh, you know, like a classic, uh, you know, Stan Smith toe playing. Uh, Oceanias were big, you know, those the running shoes were very, very big. That second shoe you described, that's the one I, I had. They're really. But I don't, never knew the name of it. Yeah, the Oceania. And then, of course, from Adidas, it was like the Oregon, the the uh, Rod Laver, the Stan Smith. Uh, another big, big shoe at that time was the Country. In, do in that time, the, those were very, very big shoes for South American. Uh, you, you know, you had different shoes. You had like, like the uh, the Jabbar and uh, and the basketball uh, and the. Uh, Nick player, the Clyde, of course the Puma Clyde, I forgot about the Puma Clyde, how big it was, and uh, that, it was, you were selling those to the young urban kids. Well, you know, the, the Jordans, it, it's funny because even, even in those days, the Jordan, like the retro ones, when we had the original ones, and the twos, and the threes, I mean, I, I didn't really understand to the extent of what this gentleman, Michael Jordan, was going to do to the business and how he was going to revo revolutionize the whole, the whole situation would really, 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 it was, it was a big turning point. Even though, you know, Nike, it was Nike's line per se, and of course at that time Jordan was, uh, the regular Nike rep would be carrying the Jordan line because it was like, you know, a small case and, and whatever it was, and, and it grew into a line by itself. Uh, the Jordan line today is, is an unbelievable line. It's, uh, even even the, the man has not played ball in umpteen years, but uh, he's, he's the only person that could sell shoes without playing ball. There's a whole bunch of players which are hot, they're good, they're active, they're making all kinds of money, but they can't sell shoes. Yet Michael's, you know, he's, uh, he, keeps, he keeps pumping, he keeps pumping. And the two came around and uh, which wasn't, you know, that it was exciting, but it wasn't what it was. Then of course the three came around and that was like, wow, it's like unbelievable. Then, you know, of course I started understanding what you were doing and uh, what level 
you know, we were going and, and you know, you, once you had the three, the kids already were, you know, they didn't have the three on their foot yet and they were already trying to figure out what the four is going to be like. <laughs> there was no internet, there was, uh, you know, cell phones were non-existing. Uh, it was, uh, it was, a, it was, it was a different time.